uh, and A to Z of literature. We will be covering concepts and writers and pieces of literature across, you know, across literatures. So let's go to today's class. And before that, let me give you a brief introduction to the structure of this course. So you will have theme-based lectures. For instance, a lecture based on symbolism, followed by a series of lectures on uh, representation of fish in literature, birds in literature, animals in literature, and so on. And two notes, it will reach you by, uh, by the end of this month. There will be notes for each and every section in the syllabus. One on poetry, short story, novel, prose. Then you have poetry, uh, linguistics, theory, and one on pointers on literatures. And third, weekly test. This time I will send you uh, 20 sets of weekly tests in the very beginning itself. By the time you finish, finish this up, I will have sent you 21, 22, 23. Uh, through our app, we have an app for uh, tests. So through that app, I will send you um, the updated uh, weekly tests. And worksheets, there are 10, which will be sent to you. So if you want a demonstration for how to work out worksheets, we already uh, released a video on that. You can go to Professor Academy's YouTube channel, and there you can go to the playlist uh, for find out three-day webinar. So first day, you will... Uh, you can look at a video on how to prepare for net and set. Second day is on uh, first weekly test. Third day is on first worksheet. At the end of the course, you will take a series of mock tests. And sixth, uh, this time I will also be discussing, you know, literary discussion in the sense of we will discuss specific essays and poems and other things. And seven, there is a YouTube series we have been running for a while, uh, English Literatures. Uh, just a short video, less than five minutes, um, each one focusing focusing on a specific aspect, a kind of a, in the form of an objective. So that will be interesting. Um, you can also check them out. So far, we have released 15 objectives. So check it out on our YouTube channel. Now let's go to today's class. And A to Z of literature, part one. A for Ariel, of course, as you know, an airy spirit in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. The Tempest is one of his romance plays. The other romance plays includes Pericles, The Winter's Tale, and Cymbeline. Sometimes you might expect a question like this. Okay, which of the following is not a romance play written by Shakespeare? So famous romance plays, The Tempest, Cymbeline, the Winter's Tale, and one more, um, you have uh, Pericles. And Ariel, as you know, was an airy spirit uh, who was uh, imprisoned in a tree by the witch Psychorox, who was also uh, the mother of Caliban. And Ariel was released from the tree by Prospero. So uh, Ariel serves Prospero. And this is his famous song, Full Fathom Phi. Thy father lies. Fathom here refers to the depth of water. One fathom equals uh, six feet. So we can say full fathom five, 30 feet. Thy father refers to here Ferdinand. You know, initially Prospero uh, brings up a storm, a uh, tempest, and kind of an illusion. And there is a party that comes to the island. And you have Ferdinand the prince of Naples, and whose father, you know, Alonso, king of Naples. Uh, Ferdinand believes that his father is dead and might be lying at the bottom of the sea. So that's what the line refers to. Full fathom five, thy father lies. So Ariel is singing or addressing Ferdinand, but the father is not dead. You know, it's a romance play. Everything, all is well that ends well at the end of the play. So... What I'm trying to say, so I'm just introducing Ariel, which uh, who you're already aware of. So once you know this Ariel, you can also know there is a uh, collection of poetry called, a collection of poems called Ariel by Sylvia Plot, the American confessional poet. And this collection has um, famous poems like Daddy, Lady Lazarus, and other poems. And with this, you can also connect with another aerial, an airy spirit 
in Alexander Pope's mock epic, The Rip of the Lock. And in this poem, I mean, in this uh, mock poem, you have Belinda and, you know, there is something, you know, something bad is going to happen to Belinda whose lock of hair is going to be stolen by the Baron. So Ariel, the guardian sylph, uh, sylph is kind of a fairy or a kind of a spirit. So Ariel is the guardian spirit of Belinda. So Ariel has to make sure that nothing goes wrong. So Ariel allots duties to other sylphs like Zephyrita. Zephyrista has to take care of Belinda's fan. Brilliant has to take care of uh, Belinda's earring. Momentilla, watch. Kriskisa, locks of hair. 50 sylphs, petticoat. And generally they ask question, who is allotted for what? And it is confusing sometimes, you can't remember all these things. Some, you should have some techniques when you prepare. Um, you, you can have your personal you know, techniques, like mnemonic techniques, some, something to remember. For instance, first one, Zephyr in English refers to the god of west wind, Zephyr. And Zephyrita, so you can easily associate with the fan. So Zephyrita, the west wind, something with the wind, fan, it is something with the air and wind. So the moment you think of Zephyrita, you can easily think of fan. Then in English, when we say brilliant, it's original meaning something that shines. So automatically you have uh, earrings of Belinda which shines. So that's one kind of uh, kind of a technique. Okay, uh, what is you know what shines? Okay, earrings shines, earrings shine. That's all. Then moment it refers to time. Automatically watch. Maybe Belinda's hair, uh, locks of hair is crispy. So crisp sound. Then why petticoat? Petticoat is a symbol of virginity. So Ariel has to protect the virginity of Belinda. So that's why we have 50 sylphs guarding petticoat. So what we have done with A, letter A is that Ariel, so we have Tempest. Ariel, you think of Sylvia Plot. Ariel, you think of the rip of the lock. When it comes to preparation, you know, when you, you know, the preparation of net or set, you have to remember a lot of things when it comes to English literature. So you have to create a web of ideas. You have to have a thread of ideas. So what do you do hereafter when you think of aerial, you have to think of all the aerials. So I mean, it is only three aerials today, aerial in the Tempest, then Sylvia Plot's aerial, then the mock of the epic, uh, sorry, the, uh, the rape of the lock, you have aerial. There are also other aerials which we will discuss in the upcoming classes. We'll go to B. B for bingo, as in a game. Bingo, I won. So bingo is the name of a play written by uh, the English playwright Edward Bourne in 1973. Uh, the subtitle, Scenes of Money and uh, Other Things. So what happens in this play, Shakespeare comes as a character. And Shakespeare is old now. And this play captures the last years of Shakespeare, 1615, 1616. And one, in one of the plays, sorry, in one of the scenes, we have Ben Johnson um, meeting Shakespeare and they discuss certain things. So that's the dialogue we have here. Ben Johnson says, what are you writing? That Theta told me to ask. Shakespeare shakes his head, sorry. Johnson, what do you do, uh, Shakespeare? There is the house, people I'm responsible for, the garden's too big, time goes. I'm surprised how old I have got. So at the last stage of his life, he has, um, he has, gone, to, he has gone back to his uh, town, Avon, and he signed a contract with someone, but the contract is beneficial to Shakespeare, but not beneficial to the local farmers. So now he's more money-minded, and at the later stage, his, uh, his conscience you know, pricks him because he has done injustice to the local farmers. So this play is more of, you know, it has a Marxist touch influenced by Brecht, another, uh, uh, you know, another playwright, German playwright, right? So you have to think of B, B for bingo and remember this play. And when you think of Edward Bond, is other plays uh, associated with uh, Shakespeare. We have Lear, 
one of his plays. Then when we think of Edward Bond, his most famous play, Saved, in which we have a disturbing scene. We have a baby who is stoned to death by adults. And that created a sensation when this play was released for the first time. So that is a saved. So Edward Bond, think of the previous one, Bingo, Lear, and Saved. Contemporary British uh, playwright. We'll go to the next one. C. C for cockroach. In literature, when we think of cockroach, I think this is the cockroach we we are we think of. Uh, for instance, um, uh, Francis Kafka's short story, the famous short story, The Metamorphosis. You know the opening line. As Griha Samsa woke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed into some kind of monstrous vermin. Uh, generally, this vermin is translated in as uh, cockroach. So you know this story, there is a salesman. It's almost as uh, life is monotonous. One day he wakes up, finds himself turned into a cockroach. And that's the opening scene. You have the cover page here. It's opening trouble. Uh, he can't turn up, you know, he can't get up and finds himself um, with a lot of legs. And there's a knock at the door, sister, and then parents, then also the manager comes. There are a lot of other struggles and ultimately when Gregor Samsa dies at the end of the short, uh, short story, the entire family is happy that he is dead because he has been a burden to all of them. But anyway, the, when we discuss this short story, Francis Kafka's The Metamorphosis, it is associated with um, existentialism. There is a philosophy, existential philosophy, which says life is meaningless. Just live it. Don't, uh, don't look for meaning in life. Just leave, don't look for meaning. And there is a recent novel, I think in 2019, uh, called The Cockroach, written by the British novelist, Ian McEwan. It is a reversal of Francis Kafka's The Metamorphosis. In Metamorphosis, you have a person, a salesman, Gregor Samsa, turned into a cockroach, but here a cockroach turned into the prime minister of England. And uh, Ian McEwen, he criticized British decision, you know, Britain's decision to come out of European Union. We have a name called BRICST. British exist from European Union. So it is a satire of that one. Um, so it's kind of a reversal of the you know, uh, Kafka story. So hereafter, think of cockroach, think of Kafka, and think of uh, Ian McEwen. We'll go for D. D for dramatic irony. Now, what is a dramatic irony? Uh, it's a situation in a play where audience know more about that particular situation than the characters do. For instance, here is a play, the Greek playwright Sophocles, Oedipus Rex. As you know, the title Rex refers to king. So if you translate Oedipus the king, it's also called uh, Oedipus Tyrannus or Oedipus Tyrannus. These are some of the other names for the same play, Oedipus Rex. And you know the story, Oedipus kills his father and unwittingly marries his mother. And that's the tragedy for him. So now he is ruling Thebes and Thebes is struck with plague. Why? The Oracle says, you know, you are suffering because there was a murderer who is yet to be brought to justice. Someone killed the former king, King Laius. And the murder is yet to be brought to justice. That's why, you know, your country is uh, struck with uh, plague. So what is the solution? So Oedipus was told, you have to bring the murderer to justice. But this is the irony. It, this, is the, um, this is what Oedipus says. And where might he be, the, the, the murderer? Where shall we hope to uncover the faded traces of that far distant crime? That refers to uh, the murder of King Laius. So what is the irony here? Oedipus says, I'm going to uh, you know, put that person, the perpetrator, 
behind the bars but he is not aware that he was the killer but the audience they are you know they are very much aware that edipus killed his own father so this is the dramatic irony the situation where audience know better you know about the situation than the character themselves so this is the this is called dramatic irony next we'll go to e e for epiphany um it's a christian term a religious term which refers to uh, the manifestation of god you know god reveals himself to you know uh, his devotees so it refers to the bible where uh, jesus christ reveals himself manifests himself to the magi for the first time so it's a kind of a realization so basically epiphany is a religious term but it is turned into a literary uh, not why i want say technique but a literary concept by uh, the irish writer james joyce for james joyce epiphany is a moment of self realization now everybody has a self realization we realize okay this is what i i am going to be in my life so that's moment of realization for instance uh, you have this uh, novel 1916 novel a portrait of the artist as a young man hero stephen dedalus so stephen dedalus has this problem like of hamlet's problem to be or not to be he wants to be a priest at the same time he wants to be an artist he can't be both this was the same situation uh, now this was a situation faced by another famous uh, poet jm uh, hopkins hopkins was also a priest a jesuit priest he thought writing poems or writing um pieces of literature is sin because you indulge in pleasure so he burned a lot of his poems uh jim hopkins so same situation here you have stephen dedalus who wants to be a priest but in in his mind or in his inner self uh, there is a voice which says hey you want to be an artist don't you so he has to listen to this question and ultimately there is a scene where stephen dedalus sees a girl playing with the waves on the beach and this scene disturbs him as an artist he wants to capture this scene in his work and that is the moment he decides no i don't want to be a priest i want to be an artist i want to be a writer and at the end of this novel he leaves ireland for europe and it is a semi autobiographical novel because james joyce also left ireland for europe especially paris so that is the moment it's kind of a eureka moment you know the moment you realize there is something you realize oh this is what i want to be you can also find similar situations uh, similar epiphanies in james joyce's short story collection dubliners so when you think of epiphany think of james jones and these two works one the short story collection dubliners and the novel a portrait of the artist as a young man there are other other concepts for this for instance uh, words words use spots of time s p o t s spots of time similar concept because i hope you remember um, in one of his poems resolution and independence wordsworth is dejected you know he is sad he couldn't write he is not inspired enough then he sees a leech gather an old man collecting leech leech you know were used for even still used for uh, medicine purposes it sucks bad blood out of the body and the old man doesn't bother about you know anything he just collects and he has to sell and he has to live that day and this inspires wordsworth to write um that is kind of a moment of self realization but instead of using epiphany he uses his own coinage spots of time so think of epiphany think of uh, spots of time by wordsworth too we'll go to the next one f f for feminine feminist and female so these are the faces of um, faces identified by elaine shawalter 
in her famous book, a literature of their own from Charlotte Bronte to Doris Lessing. Ellen Showalter asked a simple question. You know, you have British literature, the canons, you know, established authors, but it's more, it's more, you know, male oriented. So she's, she said, okay, I'm going to trace the female tradition in the British tradition of literature. So there is an essay or a part in this book called The Female Tradition. And she traces the past or the faces of, of you know, and the literature of their own in the sense of women's literature. So she says the first phase in the British period and you know, on the British uh, canon, uh, you have uh, the feminine phase. You know, when it comes to the works of women, the first phase is more imitation. Uh, women, they chose pseudonyms like uh, George, uh, George Eliot, Mary, Mary Ann Evans. She chose George Eliot as a pseudonym. So they hid their identity and they wrote like men or imitated men's writing. So that's the first stage. From the appearance of the male pseudonym in the 1840s to the death of George Eliot in 1880. By that time, they had come out of that phase, imitation phase. They went to protest. The feminist phase, 1880 to 1920, are the winning of the oath. Women should have the right to oath. They fought for that and other basic rights for education. So this period is more for protest, you know, demanding their rights. The next phase, the female phase. So it's like epiphany, like of a kind of a moment of realization, self-discovery. 1920 to the present time, but generally, but entering a phase, you know, new stage of self-awareness about 1960. So this is the phase they discover a language for their own. They talk about their own body, their feelings. So the subject is more women. So this, these are the three phases she identifies when she traces um, a tradition for female, a tradition of their own, you know, British women writers. And the title, a literature of their own, you know, it is inspired from Virginia Woolf's uh, oak, A Room of One's Own. Famous novelist and feminist, Virginia Woolf. She wrote this famous work, A Room of One's Own. If a woman writer has to write, she should have a room of one's own and money and food. If you don't have these three things, you can't write. So they need some, you know, they need the basic things which are taken for granted, which are taken for granted by uh, male writers. So the title is taken from Virginia Woolf's work, A Room of One's Own. Even Virginia Woolf's novel, if you think of Epiphany, you think of James Joyce and a portrait of the artist as a young man and Stephen Dedalus. You can also think of Lily Bresco. So Lily Bresco comes in To the Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf's novel, To the Lighthouse. Lily Bresco is a painter in that novel. Initially, she couldn't come up with, you know, uh, she couldn't identify herself with her work and uh, she's a disturbed. At the end of the novel, she realizes that she wants to be an artist. She doesn't bother about what people say about her art. And finally, she achieves what she wants at the end of that novel. She comes up with a beautiful portrait, kind of an impressionist painting. So hereafter, you can think of Epiphany, you can think of Stephen Dedalus, Wordsworth, Spots of Time, uh, especially the Leech Gatherer scene. And you can come to Virginia Woolf's uh, To the Lighthouse, where you have this character called Lily Bresco. And also think of the female face in this essay called, or the chapter called, The Female Tradition in this work, a literature of their own. We'll go for G. G is simply G, in the sense there is a novel titled simply G uh, by this writer, John Berger. Sometimes they will ask this kind of interesting questions. They will give you very simple thing and they will ask you to uh, identify who wrote this and who wrote that. So you have a novel simply titled the letter G. And similar way we have uh, uh, novels like M by F, Anthony Burgess, uh, whose famous work, anyone? Anthony Burgess, 
who is known for his famous work, a kind of a dystopian novel. Clockwork Orange. Yes, beautiful. The Clockwork Orange. So that is Anthony Burgess. So Anthony Burgess has written M by F. Then you have John Updick, simply yes, full stop. Then you have uh, this postmodern writer, uh, Thomas Pynchon, V. So you will be confused when you get this kind of question. Who wrote the novel V? Who wrote the novel S or M by F? What I have to do, you know, we have to practice. In the upcoming classes, definitely I will ask a few questions. Uh, you know, when we take class, I will just ask you a few questions uh, based on previous lectures so that we can recall all these things. Next, we will move on. H. Of course, this is the first class and A to Z of uh, literature. There will be part two, part three uh, coming up. But when I think of H, only one person comes to my mind, Hamlet. Of course, to be or not to be, that is a question for this gentleman, this prince of Denmark. And uh, William Hazlitt, in his famous work, Characters of Shakespeare's Plays, says, Hamlet is the most amiable of misanthropes. Misanthrope is one who hates humankind. But Hamlet hates humankind, but you know, we can love this guy because we still love this guy because we don't know whether he's really mad or uh, he pretends to be mad. Of course, he pretends to be mad. But that is something to this fellow we want to find out. Uh, to be or not to be questioned. We will discuss Hamlet in the upcoming classes. But there is an interesting thing uh, with uh, the representation of Hamlet. There is this uh, French actress, Sarah Benhart. She played Hamlet on the stage. Of course, there are um, there were people before Sarah Benhart who played Hamlet, you know, women uh, actresses. Uh, but Sarah Benhart, you know, was radical. You now here is the scene. Uh, she holds the skull of the court jester, Yorick. And she delivers that dialogue, right? So this is a very famous scene. When we think of Hamlet, Hamlet holding the skull in his hand. So here is a, an actress who holding that. So she shatters that image, you know, masculine image associated with Hamlet. And she brings her femininity to her acting and uh, gives a different shape to Hamlet. And she was the first one to play Hamlet in a movie, Sarah Benhart. Next, we'll go for I. I is interlude. Interlude is a short play, I would say a short st stage entertainment, generally performed between the acts of a play. So uh, if you have five acts, maybe the third act is a kind of a break, a short one, generally humorous. So famous one who is known for interludes, John Haywood, the four piece, 1522. Four piece refers to Palmer. Who is a Palmer or who was a Palmer? One who has um, gone or uh, one has visited a holy land. And when he comes back, he comes back with a palm, leaves of a palm tree. That's why he's called Palmer. It's a kind of a symbol. You know, even Jesus Christ, he was welcomed with palm leaves. So that's why he's called Palmer. He, he comes back from the Holy Land with a palm leaf, a palmer. Something to do with um, you no know, religious person associated with the church. Next, you have Pardoner. Pardoner is a kind of a priest. Uh, he is uh, authorized by the church to sell pardons. If someone has committed a crime, this person can listen to the confession of that person and he can give pardon to that person for which they have to pay something. And that money goes to the benefit of the church for the welfare of the church and the congregation. But the thing, irony is uh, the, this pardoner and this uh, palmer, they are not religious, they are corrupt. Then we have apothecary, A is missing here. That's why we have uh, apostrophe there. Apothecary is a pharmacist, one who makes medicine and sells medicine. So here uh, we may not know that whether he is a true pharmacist. He makes money out of that, a lot of money. Then we have peddler. Peddler is one who sells small things. Uh, he goes uh, to home from home to home and he sells uh, cloths, perfumes, and a lot of small things. 
especially to women. So this is these are the four P's: farmer, gardener, apothecary, and peddler. And they have a competition now. A competition, I mean, it's a contest in lying. Who is the best liar? So that's the competition. So that's where the humor lies. So they reveal themselves. Pardoner talks about his sin. Then Palmer talks about his sin, uh, not as a sin. They take pride in what they do. So that's where, uh, you know, it's a kind of uh, satire. They, you know, the writer reveals who they are, but that is fun to it. We'll go to the next one. J. J for Jacobian age. Before we should discuss Jacobian age, we go to history of uh, English literature. First one, Old English period, which is also called uh, the Anglo-Saxon period because of the tribes, the Germanic tribes, Angles and Saxons and Jutes. So 450, 1066. So why 1066, anyone? Why that year? Norman what? conquest. Yes, Norman conquest. So 1066, Norman conquest. Then you have Middle English period, 1066, 1558. And this period is also called Anglo-Norman period because French, they invaded England. So earlier, uh, this island, Britain was invaded by the Germanic tribes, uh, Angles, Saxons, and Jutes. Now you have Normans from France. So Anglo-Norman period. So if you want to refer specifically to that period, you have 1100 to 1350, you know, the starting of Chaucer's period. Then the Renaissance, you know, new birth. So 1558, Queen Elizabeth comes to throne. Then uh, 1603, she dies. Then you have Jacobian age, Jac Jacobian, that's what we are discussing today, J for Jacobian. James I. James in Latin means Jacobus. So we have Jacobian age. He comes to throne in 1603, so 1625 he dies. Then you have Charles I. He comes to throne in 1625 and dies in uh, 1649. He was beheaded uh, in 1649. And Puritan age, you know, the Puritans ruled the country. And that period is called the Commonwealth period or Puritan interregnum. Why interregnum? As you know, you can connect with the Rex. In Oedipus Rex, you have Rex, R-E-X. Rex means king. Similar way, Reg, R-E-G, which also means king. So interregnum refers to between two kings. So that's why it's called Puritan interregnum. So the first king, Charles I. Second king, Charles II. So in 1649, Charles I was beheaded. 1660, Charles II came back to throne. Monarchy was restored, 1660. So between these two kings, we, we have this period, Puritan age. Oliver Cromwell rules. So this is Puritan interregnum. Then you have the neoclassical age, uh, also called the restoration age because monarchy was restored. Charles II came back, theaters were uh, reopened because the theaters were closed in which year, by the way? Theaters were closed in England in the year 16... 40, uh, 42, 1642. In 1642, theaters were closed. 1649, Charles I was beheaded. And theaters were reopened in 1660 after the restoration of monarchy. And this period, you can divide restoration age is called the age of Dryden, 1660, 1700. Then Augustan age, sometimes the restoration age or Dryden Pope, uh, combinedly called Augustan age. Age of Pope, 1700, 1745. You know. Why Augustus? Because they imitated that famous period, Augustus, you know, Augustus Caesar, where we have Virgil, Ovid, and other famous uh, Roman poets and other writers. So that's why they imitated classic style of writing. That's why we call this period neoclassical, going back to the classical period. And they came up with something called uh, heroic couplet, of course, introduced by Chaucer, but they perfected it. Two lines, like uh, Tirukkural in Tamil. Only two lines, a couplet. Heroic couplet, uh, written in iambic pentameter. We will discuss meter in, uh, meter in one class. 
all the meters. So iambic pentameter, couplet, only two lines. The thing is, it is a closed one in the sense idea should not go out of, you know, if you start an idea, that idea should end within the two lines. It should not go to the next line. So crisp, two lines, one idea, two lines, one idea. So it's um, very classical in the sense, uh, rigorous too. Next, we have age of sensibility, age of Dr. Johnson, 1745 to 1798. And we have a significant year in between, 1755. The publication of his dictionary, Johnson's dictionary, 1755. Then we have the Romantic Age, publication of lyrical ballads, 1798. Then 1832 or 37. Why? 1832, Reformation Bill, the first Reformation Bill. 1837, Queen Victoria came to the throne. And that is uh, Queen Victorian, uh, the Victorian age, 1832 or 37. And 1901, she died. After that, no monarchy. I'm, I'm in a sense, uh, monarchy is not you know, up to the mark then. Uh, the modern period, 1901, 1950. Sometimes uh, we have Edwardian period, King Edward, 1901 to 1914, World War One. Then after 1950, we have till now the postmodern age. So just uh, think of all these things. Uh, sometimes they will ask a direct question. The period, 1832, 37, 1901. They may simply ask you that question. It was once asked in a, a set exam. Okay, we'll go to the next one, K. K for kenning. Kenning is a uh, kind of a technique or a kind of um, something with words. It comes in Old English period. We just saw now, 450,066. The use of a circumlocution in the form of compound nouns in Old English period. What do you mean by that? In the sense, they make compound nouns to talk about certain things. So instead of saying directly certain things, addressing certain things directly, they talk about things in a roundabout manner. That is uh, what uh, circumlocution means. For instance, whale road refers to ocean. So instead of saying ocean directly, they have come up with a compound noun. So whale hyphen road. So the road on which whales travel, and that's ocean. So instead of saying ocean, they have this kind of a technique or uh, 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 kind of a coinage. So this is called kenning, coming up with compound nouns to refer to a concept. Then you have bone house, refers to human's body, a house made of bones, so human body. Then uh, we have this epic, Old English epic poem, Beolf. So in Beolf, you can find this kenning. Number one, battle serpent. So what is this battle serpent? It refers to arrow. You know, when it comes to battle, so the arrow looks like battle serpent. Then who is battle wolf? A warrior, a soldier. Then battle sweat, you can find out easily now. Battle sweat. So what is shed in the battlefield? So you can blood. guess now. Yes, blood. 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 Of course. Blood. So that's, a, so this is how they, this is simply mean kenning you know, compound nouns, so battle sweat. So if you are interested, you can uh, check this uh, out. There are a lot of other interesting coinages. And Beolf, who translated Beolf into modern verse or modern English, especially verse, modern words, Irish uh, poet, anyone? Uh, Seamus, Seamus Heaney. So you can check out Seamus Heaney, Irish player, uh, sorry, Irish writer point. So he translated Beolf into modern English, especially verse. Uh, we also have another translation by Tolkien, but that is more prose, prosaic. Uh, Seamus Heaney, uh, verse one. Uh, I read that version, verse, very beautiful verse. You can enjoy reading Beolf. We'll go for L. L for Laputa. Uh, very much aware of this uh, place which comes in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travel. So Gulliver visits, uh, you know, four journeys. Number one, you have Lilliput. It's a land of tiny people, small one. That's what we you see on the cover here. Then part two, exact opposite. Brobding Nag, a land of gigantic people. 
Then you have Laputa, a tiny flying island. We will discuss Laputa immediately. Then you have part four, Huynim. I mean, Huynim, Huynim. An island of intelligent horses. So that's the last period. After speaking to these horses, uh, uh, Gulliver hates uh, human beings. Uh, especially, and in that island, they also have uh, a kind of a group of people called the Yagus, a human-like uh, people. He hates them, and he started buying horses. In, he talks with horses, and it doesn't um, go well with the world. So that's the end of Gulliver's travel. Okay, now we focus on Laputa. So Laputa is a tiny flying island, and Laputa refers to England, you know, the island. And he also uh, criticizes, um, you know, because it acts like a colonizer. Of course, uh, it was a colonizer. They colonize people. So it's kind of a symbolism. See, it's a flying island. What they do, they control the dominions under it. For instance, uh, you have one dominion, uh, Balni Barbi. It, it stands for Ireland, symbolically refers to Ireland. Because England controls Ireland, economically, everything. So England colonized um, and killed a lot of people in Ireland. So it is more symbolic what this island does or the people in, in this island. If the dominions under them refuse to pay you know, tribute to them, what they do, they fly this island over, over that dominion and they block rain and sunlight to that dominion. So automatically the dominion is reduced to poverty and they are forced to surrender and they have to pay tribute to Laputa. This is how Laputa survives. So it's very symbolic and um, people when, I don't think why when people discuss uh, colonization or post colonialism, uh, they talk about this Laputa, maybe very symbolic. Uh, I never came across any professor or any book talking about uh, Laputa in connection with uh, post colonialism. It will be very interesting to discuss this image and this scene where they block uh, sunlight and rain and deprive uh, the dominion under it of you know, um, food and other things. And after this, uh, Gulliver go to its capital, you know, Laputa's capital, Lagoda, where there is a center, an academy of projectors, uh, which refers to Royal Academy in England. He is mocking that academy because in this island, you know, in this academy, uh, the academy of projectors, Scientists are engaged in impractical projects. One of the famous projects, how to extract sunlight or sunbeam from cucumbers, beautiful project. So it's a satire on uh, the Royal Academy in England. Next from there, uh, Gulliver goes to his neighboring island, uh, Glub Dub Drip, uh, tough to pronounce, Glub Dub Drip. Uh, the island of sorcerers, magicians, they have some power to bring back the dead for 24 hours and the dead, uh, they serve the living for 24 hours. So Gulliver meets um, Alexander the Great, Caesar, Brutus and other Pompey and other uh, uh, famous uh, men. And he also talks with, you know, he, he talks with uh, Alexander the Great. He comes to know that uh, history was uh, distorted because uh, Alexander the Great confesses, you know, I didn't die of poisoning. I drank a lot. I, I died because I drank a lot. You know, was a heavy drinker. He confesses this to Gulliver. Then Gulliver, oh my God. So history is not made of truth. It's made of uh, you know, falsehood. From there, Gulliver goes to the kingdom of uh, Lagnag. Also, uh, the people there called uh, the Straddlebergs. Uh, the interesting thing is they, uh, they, don't, they don't die uh, in the sense they are immortals. They don't die there. But the curse is they grow old, not young. So they don't die, but the curse is they grow old all the time. So that is a curse. Uh, now, uh, what is the benefit of uh, dying forever if you do not have youthhood? So that is more of a boon plus curse for that um, place. From there, Gulliver goes to Japan, from there to England. That's how Laputa comes to end, the third part. And the fourth part begins, Hoenum. So we'll go to next one, M. M for 
Mona Inominata. It's a collection of sonnets by Christina Rossetti, Victorian poet. Mona Inominata, a sonnet of sonnets. Um, and this is what she writes in the preface of this collection. Had the great poetess of our own time, uh, the great poetess of our own time refers to uh, Browning, Browning's wife, I don't know, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. We could say Browning, a husband of uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So Elizabeth Barrett Browning was more famous than Browning in his uh, days. So had the great poetess of our own time refers to Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So Elizabeth Barrett Browning wrote a collection, a collection of sonnets, sonnets from the Portuguese. And that collection is full of poems, love poems, happy poems. But Krishna Rossetti says, if that great poetess were sad, she would have, she would have written something else uh, instead of uh, Portuguese sonnets. She would have read Dona Inominat or Mona Inominata. Inominata in the same, uh, you know, a nameless women or unknown women, Mona women or lady. Inominata, you have this nom, N O M means name in English. I mean, Latin, nom, nomination, you know, name. So, Inominata without a name, so unknown lady. So, let's compare. So, on the one side, you have Elizabeth Barrett Browning. On the other side, you have Krishna Rossetti. So, her uh, sonnets, sonnets from the Portuguese, 44 sonnets, 1850. Then here, Mona in America, 14 sonnets, 1881. On the one side, you have happy love poems, you know, successful love. Uh, I'm quoting from sonnet 43. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. Beautiful. But on the other side, you have unrequited love, kind of love failure. So you have youth gone, beauty gone, what doth remain? The longing of a heart pent up for long, a silent heart whose silence loves and longs. That's what you are left with, you know, if your love doesn't succeed. So sonnet 14, the last sonnet in this collection. And there's something interesting about the naming of uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning's collection, sonnets from the Portuguese. The Portuguese, you know, uh, seemingly refers to a translation. Uh, you know, you can look at uh, books, uh, translated books, you can find translated from the Tamil, translated from the French, translated from the Russian or the Hindi. I always have the question, why the article the? Because it refers to the original, the Portuguese original. So it, the title gives the impression, sonnets translated from the Portuguese original. So that is the impression we get from the title. But there is something you know, interesting about the title because the Portuguese refers to Elizabeth Barrett Browning because that's a nickname or a pet name given by Browning to Elizabeth Barrett Browning. And Elizabeth Bra Barrett Browning was uh, you know, house arrested when uh, his father came to know about her love. And she wanted to publish, she wanted to convey her love to uh, Barrett Browning. She wrote this uh, collection. So the world thinks, okay, uh, these are sonnets that translate from the Portuguese, but this is a symbolic or a kind of a coded message to Barrett Browning. Sonnets from your Portuguese, your lady love, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. So, okay, these are all happy poems. Next, we'll go to Yen. Yen for the Norman Conquest, we, which, uh, which we discussed. So Norman, Norman Conquest, 1066, uh, the battle is important. At the Battle of Hastings, what happens in that battle? You have the last crowned uh, LAST, uh, Anglo-Saxon King of England, Harold Godwinson. He was uh, defeated by the Norman invaders led by William the Conqueror. Now different history comes and French language comes into England and you can see the influence of French in English even now, uh, I think more than 30, 40% uh, words in English is still from, are still from French. We'll go to the next one, uh, uh, a continuation. So when I think of this, uh, I read this um, essay recently, 
Samuel Johnson's The Life of Milton. So in, in, in this essay or in this biography or a brief biography, The Life of Milton, Samuel Johnson says once Milton was blind, he had three projects, three great works that he wanted to do. Number one, to write an epic poem, which he wrote, which he succeeded, Paradise Lost in 1668. And he thought of coming up with a history of his country, which uh, he completed uh, in the sense, the first part, the history of Britain. But the thing is, um, it's not full. You know, he, he, uh, he came up to the conquest, the Norman conquest. That's what I'm trying to connect. So hereafter, when you think of Norman conquest, also think of uh, the life of Milton, who also wrote this, the history of Britain, which covers the history from the beginning till the Norman conquest. And the third project, a history of the Latin tongue. Milton was a polyglot. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Excuse me. Sir, sorry to disturb this. No, sir, um, sir, another question. Uh, you are telling me. So, uh, this is my notes. All of me. Don't worry. No, no problem. No, it's enough. Once you listen to this, uh, it's enough. And I will talk about this. You know, what's the technique behind this one by one. Mm -hmm. And the PPT will be sent to you immediately. And the recorded lecture will also be sent to your app. Yes, sir. So you have to take notes, which I will tell you at the end of this uh, class. So okay, just uh, relax. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, anthology of uh, movies. Just mm -mm. Uh, enjoy. We will talk about this. Okay. Sure, then, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So you have Samuel Johnson's The Life of Milton. So his uh, three projects, an epic poem, the history of his country, and a dictionary of the Latin tongue. Milton was very good at Latin. He was actually a Latin secretary uh, you know, he, in that office um, during the uh, Puritan interregnum period or the Commonwealth period. He served under Cromwell. So that, that actually was a question in one of the net exam. So he, Milton worked in, you know, under uh, what office? So there was an office for Latin. Uh, he was as a Latin secretary. He has to write uh, correspondence with other countries, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, Rome. So he has to write in Latin. We'll go to the next one. O. O for objective correlative. Uh, the concept was introduced by T.S. Eliot in his famous... Uh, essay, Hamlet and his problems, which is part of uh, his famous collection, The Sacred Wood, published in 1920. But um, um, 1919, it was uh, published as, um, you know, alone. So what is this concept? Objective, correlative. This is a definition given by T.S. Eliot, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events, which shall be the formula of that particular emotion. So what is his definition at all? <laughs> So what do you mean by objective correlative? So you should correlate in the sense there should be some relationship between what is shown on the stage or what is represented and the objects that you can connect with certain emotion. So if you portray certain emotions in your work, so you should also provide the readers with certain objects. Uh, it can be a scene, it can be an object or a chain of events, a situation, so that they can connect the emotion with the objects. For instance, uh, he gives this example, the state of mind of Lady Macbeth. So you can associate our feelings with the situation because you have this famous uh, dialogue or line, all the perfumes of Arabia, sorry, all the perfumes of Arabia cannot sweeten this little hand because uh, she helped her husband kill King Duncan Macbeth. No. So Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, uh, they killed King Duncan. Now she is the queen, Lady Macbeth. But what happens in the process, she feels guilty. And that is the feeling, you know, the writer, uh, you know, Shakespeare wants to convey. You know, her conscience pricks her. She is uh, troubled by her conscience. And symbolically we have, you know, there is no blood on her hands. She washed off the blood of Duncan. But still she imagines she has that blood on her hand and she smells that blood. And that is the object or situation which we can connect. Okay, she is suffering from 
you know guilt the guilt of killing uh, you know murdering a person and in order to convey that situation or convey that emotion uh, shakespeare in you know he uses a lot of things it is a sleepwalking scene uh, lady when you say lady macbeth sleepwalking scene uh, she goes mad so her madness we can understand why she goes mad because she can't bear with guilt guilt of uh, killing a person especially a king and you have the blood or imaginary blood on her hand on the other hand we can't understand hamlet why is hamlet mad and there are you know there are not a lot of objects and situation and chains of events in that play that's what t s eliot claims so that's why t s eliot says hamlet is an artistic failure he calls hamlet the mona lisa of literature we can't interpret what kind of a smile what kind of a madness is this hamlet so that kind be a question who called hamlet an artistic failure kind of uh, kind of a direct question or the mona lisa of literature we have t s eliot and these are the reasons for calling uh, hamlet an artistic failure number 1 shakespeare's inability to handle the intractable material in the sense hamlet was not a new play in the sense not was an original play by uh, shakespeare there were some old material uh, called ur hamlet that means some prototype that existed before then you have thomas kidd kidd uh, it was said kidd was also wrote a play called hamlet so before shakespeare we have a lot of hamlets shakespeare had a lot of material to work with but he couldn't handle that material well because earlier hamlets they took revenge fast but this hamlet postpones taking revenge and that is where the genius of uh, shakespeare comes because earlier hamlets they were ing this hamlet we will discuss tomorrow what has to do with this hamlet and the age of this hamlet next one shakespeare's incapability to execute the revenge motive so uh, that's because it's a revenge play so the, definitely he should take revenge his father was killed murdered by his uncle claudius so he has to kill his uncle but he keeps postponing and uh, shakespeare couldn't deal with the effect of mother's guilt gertrude gertrude after the death of her husband king hamlet married his brother claudius her guilt uh, guilt upon her son that was not dealt with properly by shakespeare these are the accusation charges against hamlet or sorry against shakespeare by t s eliot then there are you know excess scenes or superfluous and inconsistent scenes for instance act 1 scene 2 you have polonius advisor to uh, claudius uh, laertes polonius son so polonius son laertes goes to france for studies and polonius gives pieces of advice to laertes so immediately he also sends a spy ronaldo to france he says to ronaldo ronaldo go to france spy on my son report back but ronaldo never comes back in the entire play so this this is inconsistent the scene is not complete shakespeare has forgotten ronaldo and this scene itself so uh, t s elliot points out that and finally so this these are the reasons he calls hamlet an artistic failure this complete inadequacy of the external to the emotion is precisely what is deficient in hamlet so the external objects things they don't correspond to the emotion portrayed in hamlet so that is inadequate so he calls hamlet an artistic failure so we'll go for p p for pejoration it's a concept in linguistics especially semantics semantics is a study of meaning as you know meaning changes is called a semantic change for instance you can see a change in word meaning over time from positive to negative connotation so earlier a word has had positive or neutral connotation now the same word has negative connotation for instance you have the word villain so what's the, what was the meaning of villain simple you have the word villa v i l l a villa is a country house a house a kind of a bungalow in a rural site 
and a person who takes care of that uh, is a villain a kind of a serf and when this villain i mean a person who works in a villa comes to city the city people mocks this fellow ah a rustic a country bumpkin right so what happens because of this the word villain acquires a new meaning a kind of a negative connotation it simply meant a person who worked in a villa now it refers to uh, a criminal so this kind of a change is called pejoration from positive to negative connotation so uh, let me give an example from a post structuralist critic j hillis miller known for his famous essay the critic as host so in this essay he talks about the word parasite because that was accusation critics were parasites uh, writers were original critics were parasites so he has to defend that charge so he said original meaning of parasite it comes from greek parasitos so etymologically para means beside sitos means grain simply means beside the grain so one who eats beside you so parasite refers to a fellow guest so you you invite someone to your home you have a feast with that guy who is sitting beside you eating the grain you give to that guy or girl so you call that person parasite so initially it had, it had a positive meaning now when we say parasite someone who sucks on someone you know a negative con uh, connotation you also have a plant which has this quality parasite so why this meaning because it, it there is a tradition see if you throw a party to someone that person has to return that so if you go to someone's house and eat the feast you has to give the feast you know you have to invite them to your home you have to give them feast but after a period of time people forget that they don't do that they only eat and they don't give back that's why they become parasite they eat on someone feed on someone's food okay so this is pejoration we will discuss linguistics in one class uh, semantics and semantic change there is another change there are a lot other change we we are discussing only one change today we go for q q for quasi model one of the famous characters in literature especially french literature uh, this character comes in victor hugo's famous novel the hunchback of notre dame so he was a hunchback he is uh, is in love with this uh, gypsy esmeralda but sad story esmeralda was executed uh, and this is the last uh, lines uh, paragraphs in this novel where quasimodo uh, disappears after a period of time at the end of this novel we'll go for or or for a rhizome it's a philosophical concept introduced by uh, delus and gattari in their famous work a thousand plateaus so when we when we discuss uh, criticism in the upcoming classes we will discuss uh, delus and gattari especially this concept so we will discuss this concept here what is a rhizome as you know is a subterranean stem like ginger or um, um, or a potato or anything that grows uh, under the ground so what is their nature they are heterogeneous in the sense they have no hierarchy it's not like a tree they do not have a hierarchy they go in any direction grow in any direction they have independence you know each and every section so if you just a snap of uh, a part of ginger and that part you know which was snapped off from the uh, the original one can grow have an individual life on its own there is no hierarchy and based on this concept Uh, delus and gattari they came up with a philosophical concept to study a system of thought uh, it's more philosophical concept they simply means um, if you want to study anything there should not be any hierarchy you can't say this comes first this comes again there should not be any hierarchy so this concept is based on the principles of non hierarchy and one is connected with another so there is always a relationship interrelationship between things you discuss then heterogeneity not homo homogeneity not single there are many so there is multiplicity and there are also map in a sense uh, cartography involved territory 
So if you are a tyrant, you always have territory, you mark your boundary. But when you, when you use rhizome, there is no boundary at all. You grow. And this rupture, which we talked about, a signifying rupture refers to, when it comes to rhizome, you know, the root, you can cut, cut it off anywhere. It will also grow on its own. So that is rupture. So these are the famous examples or symbols given for this concept. One, we have plant rhizome, like bulbs or tubers. Next, animals. Uh, animal rhizome, you have rats, ants. Then you have uh, one of the most important features of the rhizome, multiple entryways. There is not one way to the concept. Examples, you have burrows dug by rats. Then you have maps. There are multiple entryways. You can approach a concept from different perspectives. So these, you know, these are the features of rhizome. So we'll discuss this concept later, but something with the post-colonial, you know, post-modernism. When it comes to post-modernism, it's more for multiple meanings, not one meaning, right? So with this, we move on to the next one. Yes. Yes, for Senecan tragedy, as you know, Senecan tragedy is based on uh, the Roman playwright uh, Seneca. Uh, it, it has something to do with uh, blood revenge or bloody revenge, uh, including Hamlet. Hamlet was a Senecan tragedy. And the first one in English, we have Norton and Sackville's Gorbadoc or Ferrex and Forex, 1561. And you have the Spanish tragedy by Thomas Kidd. These are all Senecan tragedy. And these are some of the things we uh, they often ask. The first English tragedy, you have Gorbadoc. The first English play in blank words. So that is also a Gorbadoc. Then you have uh, the first English comedy in verse. That is Nicholas Idol's Rolf Reister Toyster. But beware, first English comedy, but in verse, 1552. First English comedy in prose, you have Gascoigne's The Supposes. Okay. So with this, we will go to the next one. T. T for transferred epithet. It's a figure of speech. What is an epithet? Epithet is an adjective. An adjective, maybe first we look at an example, then we'll discuss the definition. So here is an example from the Indian poet, A.K. Ramanujam's Of Mothers, Among Other Things. And I see my mother ran back from rain to the crying cradle. So cradle, you know, is a box kind of thing in which the baby sleeps. So now tell me who is crying? Is a cradle crying or the baby crying? The baby is crying. So instead of saying the baby is crying, instead of describing the baby, you know, the adjective here is a crying. It is a transfer from the baby to the cradle in which it sleeps. So if you transfer an adjective from the person pro to which it properly describes to another object, then that's called transferred epithet. Simple example, sleepless night. Yesterday I had a sleepless night because I had to take uh, today's class, first class. So transferred epithet, sleepless night. Who was sleepless? I was sleepless. But I say I had a sleepless night. I transferred sleepless from me to the night. So now you can read the definition. An epithet is transferred from the noun to which it properly belongs to another noun. So this is a figure of speech. Next, we'll go to you. You for unpopular essays. It's a famous collection by the Nobel laureate, uh, Nobel laureate Bertrand Russell. Uh, he was awarded Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. Uh, a famous collection, but uh, he ironically calls it unpopular essays. One of my favorite essays, ideas that have harmed mankind. He talks about false you know, beliefs that have destroyed mankind. And this is one of the false belief that if you want to improve your own economy, you, know, you have to destroy the economy of another country. So which he thinks is a false belief because it only produce international hatreds and rivalries. And it's also is a cause of war. So this is one of the false idea. There are a lot of other things that have harmed uh, uh, mankind. 
So he discussed all these things in this essay. V, V for where from Dung's effect, or simply means alienation effect or A effect, or sometimes V effect. Is a concept introduced by German playwright Bertolt Brecht and his famous uh, theater, epic theater and play Mother Courage and Her Children. So what is this concept? What is What do you mean by alienation effect or where from Dung's effect or A effect? It means unlike Aristotelian plays. So Aristotle said, you have to evoke pity and fear in your audience at the end of a tragedy or end of a play. So you have to connect yourself with or the, or the audience should connect themselves with what is portrayed or what is um, staged. But this is non-Aristotelian in the sense, your play should not depend on empathy. You need not connect with the audience. Audience should alienate themselves from what is shown on the stage. They should think about the issues discussed on the play. So now you can understand Brecht was a Marxist. So he want to you know, discuss problems, social problems. So that's what he came up with this effect or method, the alienation effect and which he took it from Chinese acting, okay? So both the actors and the audience, they should alienate themselves from what they see or what they act. And this is a famous essay written by Brett in Chinese acting. Okay, so we'll go to the next one. W. Womanist is a concept introduced by Alice Walker, uh, Afro-American, in her short story, Coming Apart. So in this short story, she made this statement, a womanist is a feminist only more common in the sense. So they have a concept called feminism or feminist. But Alice Walker says the concept of feminist or feminism focuses more on white women and their problem. I want to address problems faced by black women and women of other colors, other color. So she says womanism or womanist. So this concept, under this concept, they will discuss problems faced by black women and, or brown, whatever color. So that's why the, uh, she defines a womanist as a feminist only more common, not specific to some uh, white women. So now let's go to next one. Alice Walker, by the way, uh, famous works, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, subtitle, Womanist Prose, and her famous novel, the color purple. Uh, can someone tell me uh, what kind of a novel it is? You know, it's like um, the epistolary. Yes, epistolary Let novel. Epistolary, sir. Yes, uh, it made of letters, an epistolary novel. The color purple. The character was raped by her her own stepfather. She writes letters to God, and it's a kind of a relieving effect from that. So next one, we'll go for. X, we have uh, one famous word, Xanadu. The place uh, in which Kubla Khan wants to build uh, a pleasure doom, uh, which comes in Caldred's poem, Kubla Khan, or a vision in a dream, a fragment. You know this poem? He took opium, he slept, and he woke up, and he had something in his mind. He started writing this poem, and suddenly a visitor from Porlock. P-O-R-L-O-C-K. We don't know who that visitor was. So he disturbed uh, Caldridge. Caldridge thought, okay, I will come with you. So he went away and he, he forgot the dream and he forgot everything. So we have only a fragment from the dream and he called it Kubla Khan, the poem. And there is this person called John Livingston Loves, famous book, The Road to Xanadu, A Study in the Ways of the Imagination. In this book, uh, he talks about or he discusses uh, the inspiration and the wording, all the other things associated with Kubla Khan, the poem Kubla Khan, and the, um, uh, the rhyme of ancient mariner. He discusses two poems in this um, uh, book, The Road to Xanadu. And when it comes to Coleridge, his famous, uh, famous work, 
biographia literaria we have a chapter chapter 13 in which he discusses his theory fancy primary imagination and secondary imagination so he says what is fancy fancy is more of fixities and definities in the sense if you want to be a writer what do you do you have to look around you and you take everything in it's more of memory you memorize things around you you store it in your memory so you receive everything so that that he calls fancy so made of law of association you associate one thing with the other but it's more of memory mode then as a writer you evolve next is important primary imagination so this is the living power and primary agent of perception so you have you already have in your memory a lot of things now you look at the same things with the perspective from a female perspective or women's perspective you know male's perspective or some other perspective so that you can create something new out of your material then comes secondary imagination so this is an echo of the former primary imagination but here what happens see you have a perspective doesn't mean you can come up with a poem or a short story you should have the will to write it the conscious will so you have a lot of things you have seen a lot of things you have stored it in your memory then you have a perspective now you have to put it into writing so in order to do that you have to jumble everything so you dis- so what happens here it dissolves diffuses dissipates in order to recreate so you recreate everything so you can't just simply present what you see in the world so you have to create a new world in your writing so in order to do that your secondary imagination helps you so these are the concepts introduced by coleridge in biographia literaria why why for yakna patapa is a fictional country in introduced by william faulkner the american novelist in his famous work there are a lot of other works uh, one of famous works absalom absalom and he calls this imaginary place my own little postage stamp of native soil you have a lot of other uh, you know fictional place like uh, arkenarain or the fictional place arkenarain malgudi yes malgudi is we have malgudi and there are a lot of other fictional place uh, you have macanto gabriel garcia marcus so you have yakno patampa william faulkner so some of his famous works the sound and the fury as i lay dying light in august we'll go to the last one today z z for zen so you have zen buddhism this buddhism says meditation is the key to attain enlightenment and why why this zen buddhism because zen buddhism um, you know the writers of beat generation beat poets they were inspired by this zen buddhism influenced by zen buddhism you have one of the beat po- beat writers jack kerouac famous work the dharma bums so you also have uh, other beat writers so you can also connect beat writers with coleridge because these beat writers they are known for automatic writing what is this automatic writing they take uh, opium or drugs or they have alcohol and in their other worldly state you know it's like a drunkard um, giving us a philosophy so without any constraint they write works so that's what's called automatic writing you know uh, you write something under the influence of alcohol or drug it's a kind of an experiment uh, they did uh, you know the beat writers so we'll come to end of today's class so there is also another book zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and enquiry into values by robert m perzig so in this book he talks about human understanding he divides human understanding into two types a classical understanding and a romantic understanding of life classical understanding is something to do with underneath how something functions no the underlying form romantic understanding it's outward appearance immediate what you see on the surface so this is a difference between you know romantic and the classical so he gives as an example of um, uh, a motorbike so if you are a romantic a romantic you look at the outward appearance what a bike 
know, the physical features. But if you are a classicist or classical, you now you are the classical mode. So you look at how of uh, engine functions or, you know, how the motor functions, you talk about it, the mechanisms involved um, within it. So you have to check, are you a classical or a romantic? So how is your understanding? So this is what you have to find out. With this, I end today's class.